Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories. The plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The broadcasts are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research for Whitehall 1212 comes from Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. To brief you on case number 914029, here is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, custodian of Scotland Yard's Black Museum. Good afternoon. When taken out of context, the exhibits in the Black Museum seem often far removed from the murder cases in which they played most important parts either as clues or as actual weapons that cause someone's death. Now, these things here are examples. You would think that a set of false teeth, an upper plate to be exact, and a small bottle which once contained about two drams of petrol, you would think that such a collection of items would have very little connection. But I assure you, you'd be wrong. They both had something to do with a woman's death by murder. She never dreamed that these familiar things would one day encompass her death, nor could she have known they would be the death of her son, whom she loved. But they are here in the Black Museum today. They've done their part in committing a crime and then in punishing it. Chief Inspector Leslie Cameron Underhill had a great deal to do with case number 914029. He will tell you more about it. I don't suppose one could say that a man has been hanged in England in a long time at least because he ran away leaving an unpaid hotel bill. But it is certainly a fact that an unpaid hotel bill was a contributing factor in this man's death. No, he was not hanged because he defrauded the hotel, but it is true that he might have escaped had he paid it. I was called to Margate by authority of the Chief Constable of Kent, who had asked for the CID's help on the 1st of November. Inspector Charles Hatcher of the Margate Police told me what was happening. We've got him safe in jail on a charge of unlawfully obtaining credit. We shall be able to put our hands on him when we want him, all right? I don't understand what you need a CID man for on a charge like that one. A misdemeanor, Inspector? It isn't a misdemeanor we want him for, sir. What do you want him for? Murder. Oh. We can't prove it, of course, yet. So we can't charge the bladder. But as long as he's in jail, we can look about a bit. And we're hoping that perhaps you can find out if we're right in our suspicions, Mr. Underhill. I'm glad you know my name, Inspector. Eh? I got the impression you thought it was Holmes. <laughs> oh, really now, Inspector? Well, what's it all about? I know nothing, of course. Well, he did the hotel people, the Metropole here in Market, out of, I remember perfectly, eight pounds, 13 shillings, 11 pence halfpenny. Food and lodging for himself and the old lady for a week. Yeah. And then he got an advance of 40 pounds on her insurance. Was she dead? Of course, in the fire. He... Uh, uh, what fire? When her room caught on fire. When? Last week, the 23rd. What happened? She died? Suffocated. Carbon dioxide, smoke, etc. Two doctors certified her dead by misadventure. Well, then... <laughs> I don't understand it. He took her away to bury her, but instead he rushed up to Norwich. Buried her at Norwich? Her home was at Great Frencham, but he didn't go there. He went to Norwich. Yes, 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 you said that. Well, Norwich is the headquarters of the insurance company. There he got an advance of 40 pounds. But he didn't bother to come back here and pay his bills. Oh, I see. And you went up and pinched him? He's in jail here now, awaiting trial on the fraud charge. Well, then... Well, we have an idea that the old lady didn't set herself on fire, accidentally. You think he murdered her for her insurance? With your assistance, we hope to prove that. Let me tell you what we already know. Now... Uh, excuse me. Who was the old lady who got murdered? Oh, I thought I told you. His mother. <laughs> Inspector Hatcher took me over to the jail in which the prisoner, whose name I neglected to tell you, was 
Sidney Bohola Wolf was being held on the fraud charge and I was permitted to speak to him. Now, I would remind you that according to the judge's rules by which all prosecutions are conducted, an officer is forbidden to speak to a prisoner on any subject concerning the crime or misdemeanor with which he is presently charged. The prisoner is under no compulsion to speak except of his own free will. He is warned at the time of his arrest, anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. But he may be questioned freely on other subjects. That is not evidence. So he was brought in from his cell. This is Wolf, Chief Inspector. Thank you. Hello, sir. Now, Wolf, I'm Chief Inspector... Un Underhill's your name, yes. Oh. Did Inspector Hatcher tell you who I am? No, sir. I met you when you was a sergeant in the CRD seven years ago. Remember me? At Woking, sir? Well, by... I remember you. <laughs> Forgery, wasn't it, Wolf? I got two years for it. But it wasn't your fault. It did seem to me you had something to do with it, Wolf. Well, they said I did. Sit down, Wolf. If you don't mind, Inspector Hatcher. Oh, right ahead. Thank you, sir. Remember, you've been warned, Wolf. Yes, sir. Soft chair feels good. Not very soft, sir, is it? Well, softer than them back there in the cell, sir. Hmm. So you had your mother insured, Sid. I don't think we It's should... a matter of record, Inspector. Right. Go ahead, sir. What about it, Sidney? I wish I could have afforded more. It was only 3,000 pounds. Where did you get enough money for an insurance policy? Well, I generally get money when I need it badly enough. How long has this policy been enforced? Well, you might as well tell me. I can find out from the insurance company. Since the 22nd of April this year. You kept it paid up? Yes, sir. How have you and your mother been living? As I remember it. You, you two had a rather rough time in the past. We've had that. Go ahead and answer him, Wolf. Well, I, I had a pension, sir. Oh, yes. Eight shillings a week from my disability in the war. And what about your mother? Well, she had ten shillings pensions a week on account of my brother, Oris, was killed with a London Irish rifle, sir. You remember? Eighteen shillings a week between you. Well, there's other ways, sir. Uh, I dare say. Well, when I was sent down last year for 15 months... By but... mistake, no doubt. <laughs> well... <laughs> well, Mother went to the workers when I was at Dartymoor. She was sick. Oh, I'm sorry. And then when you got out? Oh, we came up here. A lot of other places before, though. I think I'd look up some of those other places if I were you, Hatcher. I'll just do that, Wolf. When did you come here to Margaret? About ten, eleven days ago. Where did you live? At the blasted Metropole. The place where your mother died? God rest her soul. <clears throat> were you there when your mother was killed, Sidney? I tried to rescue her. I was overcome by the smoke. That was um, <coughs> on the 22nd of October, wasn't it? 22nd of October at 9, 7 in the evening. Was your hotel bill paid then? No, sir. Why? Because I hadn't any money. Wasn't the next day, the 23rd, the sixth month after you'd taken out your insurance policy on your mother's life? Yes, sir. Did you have the money to pay that? No, sir. And so she died? Wasn't there double indemnity in case of accidental death, Sidney? Wasn't there? I think so. Curious coincidence, isn't it, Hatcher? What? She was killed on the last day her insurance policy was good. Wasn't she, Sidney? You're accusing me of murdering my mother. Uh-huh. I didn't. I, I didn't. I, I didn't have anything to do with it. How can you say such a thing? Why, I, Sidney, you were the one who said it. I, I, I didn't. You can't make me say I did. I didn't do it. It's a dirty lie. She died of her own self, a suffocation she did. Well, I even tried to pull her out. Well, that's true, Inspector. Did you, Sidney? Why, well, I all but got my own self suffocated in the smoke. You did get quite a lung full of smoke. <coughs> I nearly got myself killed. Well, now, let's not <coughs> scream and shout, Sidney. I want to know what happened when your mother died, if you please. She was... <coughs> reading the newspaper, I told you. You didn't tell me that. What? Well, I, I, I've told everyone else. She 
was reading the newspaper and the paper caught fire from the gas heater. You said she was suffocated. <coughs> so she was. I went right... Does paper make enough smoke to cause suffocation? Well, there was a lot of smoke, Chief Inspector. Enough to cause a person's death, do you suppose? Well, the easy chair caught on fire, too. I saw it after the fire brigade put it out. <coughs> it was burned quite badly. It made a lot of smoke. Her clothes were burned, too, I expect. Why, I... Why, I don't recall that they were. It must have fallen away from the chair. That's right, sir. She, she fell out of the chair, away from the flames. Mother wasn't burned at all, suffocated by the smoke. <coughs> <coughs> That's what the doctor said. <coughs> and where were you, Sidney? <coughs> I... <coughs> I was un... <coughs> unconscious. He was knocked out by the smoke. What did you do, Sidney, when you discovered the smoke? Huh? First, I mean. Oh, why, uh... I ran into the room. I'd been taking 40 winks in my room next door, and... I see my mother lying there. Through the smoke? Yes, through the smoke, yes, sir. Where was she lying? Huh? Uh, alongside the chair. Go on. <coughs> well, I tried to drag her out and... Uh, to the hallway? No, sir, I, through my room next door, but she was so heavy and I was coughing, so... It... <coughs> no, I couldn't. So I staggered out into my room and closed the door. And left your mother lying there in the smoke? What? Well, sir, I, I was fair perishing. I so wasn't. was your mother, wasn't she? Well, sir, I... I didn't think. You left your mother unconscious on the floor of a smoke-filled room with the door closed and the place on fire. Well, sir, I... I tell you, I didn't think. <laughs> I'd like to ask you something else, Sidney. Yes, sir. <coughs> what would you have done if your mother hadn't died? What, sir? You hadn't any money, had you? Either of you. I hadn't thought of that, sir. All right, Sidney, that's all for now. Well, don't you, you want me You can send him away, Hatcher, if you please. I'll talk to him again later. Right. Come along, Wolf. Yes, sir. Take him away, Constable. What's going to happen to me now, sir? You're going to be tried for defrauding a hotel keeper. If they don't decide to hang you... The crime of matricide is probably the most atrocious one I can think of. Because of its enormity, it's even more important that a man suspected of it be protected from guesses and inferences. Guilt or innocence must be established within a reasonable doubt before a man can be accused. It behooves those who pursue crime and criminals to walk softly. I talked to the man, a Mr. Adam Gunn, who carried Mrs. Wolfe's body out of the hotel room the night of the fire. Adam Gunn. That's the name, sir. Fred and Eden. Uh, Mr. Gunn, you're a guest at the Metropole Hotel. Aye. I understand you carried the body of that Mrs. Wolfe out of the fire the okay, night... Okay, sir. I am that man. Was she dead then? Uh, I think she was, sir. At least when the doctor examined her after I laid her body on the pavement, he said she was. Of suffocation? So he said, sir. Was she burned? Her clothing or anything? Well, she didn't appear to be, sir. She was lying on the bed when I came in, and... I thought she was lying on the floor. I was the one that went in the room, Inspector. She was lying on the bed, a good six or seven feet away from where the fire was smoldering, and... Smoldering? Aye. What was burning? Well, uh, the bottom of the chair appeared to be, sir, and uh, some papers beneath it. And the carpet? Oh, I don't know about that, sir. The room was quite full of smoke. Oh, it's no wonder she was suffocated. I nearly was. You had to open the door to get in. Aye. You saw no signs of her having been burned. No. She was unconscious, though. Aye. Where was Mrs. Wolfe's son? Oh, him. Oh, he was yammering and havering up in the hallway. I gathered the smoke had overcome him. He did say his mother was inside. With the doors closed? Aye, the one to the hall was locked, but the one to her son's room was only just shut. And you are sure she was unconscious at the time you found her? <laughs> okay, she was unconscious enough. What's, what's funny? Well, I wouldn't say anything ill of the dead, but I think the old lady died happy. Well, 
What do you mean, Mr. Gunn? She was lying on an empty whiskey bottle, sir. She was drunk. I talked with Dr. Edmund Whittaker, the physician who had examined Mrs. Wolfe. Yes, I examined her. Immediately afterwards, she was brought out of the room. Uh, I was passing by on my way home from my odd fellow's lodge, and I... Uh, you so... certified that she died of suffocation? Hmm? Of heart failure, superinduced by the effects of suffocation, yes. Was her heart weak? What? Right. Uh, uh, she was 67 years of age, sir. Do you have evidence that she suffered from heart disease, Dr. Whittaker? What? Right. Uh, I had already prescribed medicines for that, sir. She had a very bad heart. She was not burned? Eh? No, sir. That I can be sure of, too. Uh, could, uh, could anything else have induced a heart attack of this type, Doctor? Well, well, the whole effect of the shock might have, sir. Could drink have done it? Well, in my opinion, no. Could carbon monoxide poisoning have caused her death? What? Well, undoubtedly carbon monoxide poisoning might have, yes. The fact that I certified suffocation in this case implies that carbon monoxide was present and had a great deal to do with her death. I'm not cross-examining you, Dr. Whittaker. I, I'd like to know if she breathed carbon monoxide in sufficient quantities to kill her. Well, if one breathes in the presence of a fire of this sort, my dear sir, one must necessarily breathe carbon monoxide. Then there is even now carbon monoxide in traceable quantities in her body. Huh? Well, unquestionably, sir. The inner passages of the woman's lungs will be coated with soot and smoke, and the mere process of breathing would introduce carbon monoxide into her blood. But you didn't look to see. Of course not. That would have required a post-mortem operation, and I saw no need whatever for that. Besides, I'm not a surgeon. Do you suppose, Dr. Whittaker, that you could supply me with the name of a competent surgeon? Hmm. Uh, here, here, sir? No. In Great Frenchum. Hmm? Why? Why? Yeah, that's where the woman was buried. Precisely, my dear doctor. It wasn't necessary to find a surgeon at Great Frensham. I asked the Home Office, and they sent Sir Hubert Crosby, the best known of the Home Office pathologists, up there. A crew of local laborers conducted the exhumation, and the body was taken to a room in a temporarily vacant school building for the postmortem. While Crosby went to work with his assistant, Hatcher and I studied the blackboards in the adjacent room. Takes me back to my kid days. Well, it doesn't take me back to mine. Why not, sir? We didn't have dead people in our schoolroom. <laughs> Come to think of it, I don't believe we did either. Did have a master we often wished dead. Yes, yeah, one of those in every school. I wish that hotel manager hadn't been in such a hurry. What are you talking about? I went over there yesterday to have a look at the room where the old lady was burned up. She was suffocated, sir. Killed, let's say, till Crosby finds out. I went over there to have a look, and the blighter's got it all repaired already. Now, that helps. Got new flooring put in, the carpet before the gas fire replaced, the burn chair thrown out, everything cleaned up like new. Now, what were you looking for? Evidence, old man, remember? Oh. I wonder if he threw it on the corporation dump. He didn't say... Like me to find a telephone and call him? Why, if you would. And if you did, I'll put a constable or two onto the dump to see what they can find, shall I? Do. Ask them to bring back anything at all that they can find. Right ho. Back at once. And I'd better see someone from the fire. Oh, they didn't hear me. Oh, well, if they find anything. Who. Oh, hello, Sir Hubert. Found out anything? I thought I heard someone come in. No, it was Hatcher going out. Oh. Find anything yet? Come in and see. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I find out she's dead. <laughs> yeah. What'd she die of? I don't know yet, old man. I can tell you what she didn't die of. What? Suffocation. I mustered up courage enough to open the door where Crosby was holding his post-mortem and went in. How do you know, I asked. Look here. Oh, come closer, man. She won't hurt you. Yeah, where are the forceps? Here. See uh, here? That's, uh, that's her throat? Oh, excellent, old chap. Now, I ask you to look very carefully. <coughs> I had that formaldehyde bothers you. Breathe through some cotton wool. See? 
There isn't a sign of soot or smoke discoloration on the inside of the mouth passages. <coughs> you see? If she'd breathed smoke at all, uh, unless the passages had been carefully cleansed, there'd be unmistakable signs of it here and uh, here <coughs> and uh, here. Do you see? Uh, yeah. Apparently, she didn't breathe any smoke at all. <coughs> well, well, what does that mean, then? It could mean she was dead when the fire started. Are you sure? Ammerman's testing a sample of blood over there for traces of carbon monoxide. Find any yet, Ammerman? No indications so far, sir. And if we can't find any, then we know she was dead when the fire started. I don't know what killed her yet. Sure of one thing, though. <coughs> What's that? She was full of alcohol when she did die. And what does that indicate? <laughs> she didn't know either. <laughs> Sir Hubert Crosby returned to London and his laboratory that night with certain specimens he wanted to examine more thoroughly, and the remainder of the body of Mrs. Rose Wolf was reburied in the churchyard at Great Frencham. I went back to Margate with Inspector Hatcher, who told me that the corporation dump was already being examined. A man from the fire brigade called at me early the next morning, and, well, he wasn't much help. Yes, he'd been at fire... No, he hadn't seen body. No, nothing had been burned except a few scraps of newspaper under easy chair. Well, how about the carpet between the gas fire where it started and the chair? Hadn't been damaged at all. Not at all, I said. Not at all. He remembered that. Well, that was strange. Sir Hubert Crosby telephoned me. Crosby here, Chief Inspector. Look here, uh, this old lady wore false teeth, didn't she? I'm not sure. Wait, I'll ask Hatcher. Hatcher! Did Mrs. Wolf wear false teeth? Mm, I, I'm sure she did, yes. Hello, Sir Hubert. Hatcher says she did. Uh, I'm sure she did. Where are they? Where are they, Hatcher? Her teeth? Weren't they... I mean, wasn't she wearing them? Wasn't she wearing them? I never saw them. Well, uh, we'll look around. Uh, I, uh, I don't mean to be impertinent, Sir Hubert, but does it really make any difference? I rather think it does. There are definite bruises inside the mouth, which I believe to be from false teeth. And she wasn't wearing any in the coffin, so where are they? Well, I, I'm afraid I don't quite get it, sir. Look here, old man, you let me do my job, and when the time comes to do yours, I'll let you do it. Yes, sir. Uh, these aren't the ordinary marks, you see. Uh, they, they're, they're more in her throat than actually in the mouth. Do you know what that means? She swallowed them? It's impossible to swallow a set of false teeth, man. There wasn't a throat in the world big enough. Well, what happened then, sir? Someone pushed them down her throat. Where'd they go? It was almost time to talk to Sidney Wolfe again, I told Inspector Hatcher. The information about him being up for obtaining unlawfully has got into the police gazette. He'll be wanted in half the towns in England when we get through with him. If we do. Forgery, too. <laughs> I picked him up for that once. Yes, I remember. Uttering false checks, defrauding hotel keepers. He and his mother both. They've been living on their wits for years. What was he up for just before he came here? Seems he went to visit a widow, a friend of his mother, and walked out one evening after she'd gone to bed. They got him for one, then. Walked out, thoughtfully leaving the gas turned on. If she hadn't waked up and smelled it, he would have been down to Wandsworth long before this. I think he'll be there soon enough. I think we'd better telephone the Metropole. They should have some information by now. Oh, the hotel, yes, yeah. Come in. Constable Harris, sir, from the corporation dump. Yes, Harris. Uh, what'd you find out? We found a lady's dress, sir. Here. Oh, where was it? Where they throw the rubbish from the fire. Exact spot, the hotel dustman said. But he remembered this dress, too. Recognized it, in fact. Whose is it? Mrs. Wolfe, sir. He says. Oh. He'd seen her wearing it that very day. She always stopped and had a word of greeting from him. Is he sure about it? Yes, sir. He'll testify to it. Oh, excuse me. Spectre Underhill here. Where were they? Are you sure they're the ones? Good. Send them over here at once. Thank you. Th thank you very much. 
I beg your pardon? Oh, you have. Hers, of course. Would you send that over too, please? Yes, yes, right away. Thank you. What is it, sir? Let's have Wolf in here. Right. Uh, go out and get him, Harris. Yes, sir. What was it, sir? The hotel people called us. They found something. Oh, what? Let's let Sidney Wolf try to guess. Hello, Sidney. Hello. Bring him in here, Harris. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't sit down, Sidney. We won't keep you long. I don't know anything. We'll see. Where are your mother's false teeth? You remember now, don't you, Sidney? She had them on. No, no, she didn't. You know perfectly well she always removed them and put them in a glass of water before she went to bed. She, she had them on. She, she didn't go to bed. She was sitting in the armchair. Not after she drank the whiskey, Sidney. The whiskey you bought her for a present. I, I didn't. You knew she'd go right to sleep, didn't you, Sidney? After all that whiskey that she wasn't used to. I never gave her. Didn't you? But I didn't kill her. You said she was lying on the floor. She was lying on the bed, drunk, unconscious. No. Wearing her dressing gown, her dress hung up quite peacefully. No, I said. Quite unconscious from the liquor her son gave her and choked to death with her son's hand. No! It's true, Inspector Hatcher. Then he went over and set the fire that he claimed killed her. No, no. Oh, yes, 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 you did, Sidney. We found the bottle of petrol. Your mother used to clean that dress... And it's empty now. Her insurance was due to expire, and you didn't have much time. So you killed her. Choked her with her own false teeth. I didn't! I didn't! We can prove it, Sidney. You said your mother was wearing her teeth. She was! I've seen them, I tell you! So you did, Sidney, when you choked her. No. You didn't notice they dropped out of her mouth afterwards, did you? They found them on the floor... Behind the bed. No. No, Sidney Wolf. It won't wash. I arrest you on the charge of murdering your mother, and I warn you that anything you say will be taken down and may be used in evidence. No. Will you have this man taken away from here, Inspector? Yes, of course, he was found guilty. He was hanged at Wandsworth 37 days later. I wonder if the Lord did have mercy on his soul. Heard today in the order of their appearance on Whitehall 1212 were Harvey Hayes, Horace Braham, Winston Ross, Lester Fletcher, Pat O'Malley, Ronald Long, Carl Harbord, and Edward Ashley. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. There's a critical shortage of scientific and engineering manpower. American industry will need 30,000 engineers annually for the next decade, and only about half of this need will be supplied, according to present estimates. The Engineering Manpower Commission of Engineers Joint Council urges the American public to consider the scope and the seriousness of this problem, and consider also the effect it will have on the nation's economy. You high school students are urged to consider careers in science and engineering and consider the advantages of engineering training for positions of leadership in many, many fields. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Mm.